Quite incomparable images of Guernsey and Sark in the British Channel Islands. A moral sin, you might say, to expose such tranquility to the vulgarities of world power boating. But it's a long-standing relationship, and it's back on. Not the titans of Class 1 this time, but the equally competitive two-litre division promises much from a big international fleet. And then there's the crock of gold, the Guernsey Gold Cup. Treasured possession of any visit here goes to the winner of the World Championship who will join the exalted recipients of past decades. Plenty to look forward to then, and where the crown finally rests will depend much on the weather. Eight monohulls and nine catamarans will make sure of that. And they're all led by the current World Champions, Norway's Atli Staff and Fred Morton Lean. Number one, and very quick, in the Argo Cat. All reckon. Ingvarsson and Christian Andersson from Sweden head up the Bat Boat Challenge. The radically sleek lines of Oki Manafeld's pen stamped all over C31. The European champions will start joint favourites with England's Peter Little and David Arthur, 27. Once again, note the Manafeld influence. How odd, just a few years ago, most of the pundits thought the Scandinavian designer was crazy. In their trusty tin boat, Roy Smith and Scott Hodges represent a formidable rough water challenge. The aluminium forged craft relishes two meter plus conditions, and Smith is one of the best in the world. On the other hand, should conditions turn out to be predominantly flat, expect Yari Pekkanen and Peter Soderman, Sweden, to be knocking on the door. Ivan Villa and Jose Luis Martirano, number 10, are the Argentinian champions, but with so little competition in South America, their form is difficult to assess. And finally, the Italian number ones, Gian Paolo Montebocci and Tommaso Nobili, Best of the rough water cats. Others to watch out for. Mark and John Mumford racing 45 in the Midas Cat. At 27 feet, the longest boat, but it's also good in all conditions. Further down, Johnny Anderson will race flat out in the Tinterera. Whether he stays the right way up is another matter. And the Guernsey trio of Wash, Fox and Nicole know the water as well. And that might account for something. Well, this was the start of heat one out of three. 70.2 nautical miles a target and five assorted laps a task. Offshore power boating, remember though, isn't all about speed alone. Navigation and allowances for a wind over tide play an equally important role, even at these speeds. Sea conditions early in race one favored neither side. Nothing for the lightweight cats or the rough water monohulls. Time then you would say for the all round bat boats to take advantage. Or was it? Staff Black, Packen and Pink, and Montevocci, Red, were all right there. Montevocci's teammate, Giovanni Carpatella, 51, was eight. Two places adrift of the not quite rough enough Roy Smith, number 54, he was in six. And note the Mumfords on the outside track, 45, moving up. Surprise at the first six miles, though, was Pekkanen. Driving well beyond the hydrolift's choppy water limits, he was living dangerously close and remarkably brave. But they all trailed Little and Arthur, impeccable in preparation, and now invincible in application early in the race. But not so Ricky and Robert Hill. No problem with the preparation. Sheared engine bolts can happen to anyone. But at Sark's famous Guglio Passage the first time round, it was the world champion who got there first, surprisingly ahead of Little and Ingerson. An early warning that staff was in no mood to relinquish that title. Mackinnon was prepared to risk all to make sure he did, and Smith had settled nicely to his stride. He occupied fifth. Away from the shelter of the island, staff was forced to ease it up a little. 
And it was Peter Little who took advantage and reinstated his early position. It wasn't the size of Little's lead, but much more the conditions in which he achieved it. Ingvarsson following up note. And further evidence, it wasn't as flat as it looked. Having said that, it wasn't that rough either. First through the Gulio on the second occasion was Pekkanen, and that did raise an eyebrow or two. Little was second, Ingvarsson was third, and Starr, for all his early promise, was now fourth. And only just up on Mark Mumford, who'd enjoyed a super lap, 60.95 miles an hour, and moved himself ahead of Smith. Montevocci, too, was making up ground after dropping back to ninth. This was now seventh. Pia, on the other hand, found little to suit him. Twelfth represented a disastrous start for the Argentinian. And little in either boat or conditions was working for him. But in any three-heat competition, psychologically, points in the first race are essential. 400 for a win is great, but not at the cost of mechanical problems later on. And that's a dilemma that faced Little, Pekkanen and Ingvarsson. The XR2 Mercury engine is specifically designed for racing, but in conditions such as these, running at maximum revs for most of the time, in and out of the water, demands an awful lot from the powerhouse. And 225 points for third, or even 71 for seventh in the first, is a deal better than none in the second or the third. The weather forecast to get even and flatter over the next three days was driving Pakenham forward. Although the lead had inevitably been surrendered to Little in the rough, the resolve to hold off Ingvartsen remained. The hydrolift resembles and handles like an aeroplane. Lift is created by the centre section, and air rushing down the tunnel is forced out of the rear. But in conditions such as these, it's a fine line to take off. And there were times when Pekkanen had to give better to the monohulls just to make sure his feet stayed on the ground, or his prop in the water in this case. As the race wore on, it seemed more and more likely the Loras would rest between Little and Ingvarsson. But nothing is certain on Mother Nature's unpredictable racetrack, that's for sure. And no one was betting on anyone at the halfway mark. But all that changed on the last lap. Ingvarsson, almost as if he'd planned it that way, brushed aside the Englishman as if he wasn't there. And at the same time, staked his claim on the title. And the boat that was drawing all the admiring glances in the pits was about to reap all the points to go with them. After one hour, 14 minutes and just two seconds at an average speed of 60.85 miles an hour, Ulrich Ingvarsson and Christian Andersen brought number 31 home to the sort of victory that convinced most onlookers this would now be a one-horse championship. But how wrong they all were. This is offshore power budding. Points for a win, 300 for second, 225 for third, 169 for fourth, 127 for fifth and so on. Means no one is high and dry this early on. It's still all to play for. What do you think makes this boat so much quicker than the others? Well, I can say it's, it's a really good uh, balanced boat in both rough conditions and we have a quite good top end speed also. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite good boat in, in every conditions. Last year after the first race we was on the 21st so this is a nice position already for us. It's comfortable to be in the first but uh, today we have to go get on the podium I think to calm my nerves for the last, for the last race. <laughs> I think it maybe can be our, our weather today. We like when it's rough. I think it's a little bit rougher today than last last race. Yes you drive the boat very very hard in the yeah, rough conditions. We like that style. The weather conditions do suit us today, so suit us more than they did in the first race. So we've just got to go all out. I mean, we don't want to settle for anything less than a podium. We can't afford to. Uh, I'll just bear the Six in heat one was very, 
very good, but we need a better result if we're going to win the championship. It is rougher today, and we are confident. 31 looked to have the measure of you. Yeah, he's got the speed in us in, in his conditions in the flat water. I think basically he was using us as his, uh, his eyes, basically. We got him round, and when he wanted to, he just went past us. So what about the tactics for today then? Um, you know, a, a second's a great result. What, what do you feel you should do today? Well, we always go the same way. I mean, we go as fast as we can when we can. I mean, you could have a problem later on in the race. The, the time that you hung back at the start could be very important. So we, our tactics are always the same. So it'll be all or nothing today? Yeah, yeah, we, we'll go for it. A fairly predictable set of answers then, apart from Pekkanen. Does he really believe the hydrolift goes quicker in the rough? There's one for the Furies. This is heat two. Once again, five laps. Distance this time, 74.52 land miles. And pressure on those with few or no points to get back on the pace. No more so than Roy Smith and Scott Hodges. Seventh for them in Commodore Ferries. And conditions, if anything, less to their liking than in race one. So often in this part of the world, where the forecaster is falling short with a prediction. That was around a metre and a half. The reality is the swell here is less than one half, and that will disappoint Montevarchi, number 17. Not so Ingvarsson, though, looking to wrap this thing up after two. Conditions perfect, boat perfect. He leads Montevarchi, who, in spite of the calm, is second, little third, staff fourth, and Carpatella there, fifth. And a chance now to look at Mark Fox and Chris Bryan. They lead the go. Frenzy challenge with a first round aid, but this is no water for the Frode monohull, and he'll do well to better that in the second heat. Much the same position now for Roy Smith and co-driver Scott Hodges, high with hopes of a rough race earlier, but nothing delivered. So it was business as usual up front, in the absence of Pekkanen, perhaps he really does like the rough. Little is near side, Ingberson far side, 82 miles an hour the ground speed on the helicopter, trying to settle their differences. But then Little and Arthur, desperate for a win to settle the score, got a couple of bits of luck that makes all the difference. Ingvarsson and Anderson from 80 miles an hour were suddenly reduced to less than eight, and from the inactivity in the cockpit, it was clear their race was run. And with Packen and tripping and stuffing into one way too many, it was a double whammy for Little and Arthur, something they could have only dreamed about overnight. But there were plenty more out there to pick up the gauntlet. The championship was far from over.
But try as they might, none of them were in a position to get anywhere near number 27. And Little and Arthur completed heat two in considerable style. Montevocci was also back on course in spite of the flattening waters. A second and 300 points put him right back in contention. And just one point ahead of Atal Staff, who battled back to third in the Sonny boat. But there was no doubt at all where the air of confidence had suddenly shifted. And this is how they looked after two. And although Little and Arthur were favourites with 400 points for a win, any one of four could still pull it off. Let's find out what happened to Ingverson. Is that the uh, start part? Yes. So how did, uh, how did that happen? Well, I don't know. It, uh, it just ceased. No special reason. We didn't push any, any, any hard at all. The engine, the, the, the plug went and the engine ceased. And we went off plane and couldn't get it on plane again. OK, so no points in this round. Uh, so uh, where is your championship now? Well, the, the only way to, to get the championship is, of course, if did a little and uh, we'll, we'll break down. But that uh, would be most unlikely, I think. Disappointed? Yeah, of course. The World Championship beckons. How would that feel? Well, we just have to take it as it comes, really. We can't add to the weather or anything, you know. We can just prepare the boat like we normally do, go through it, and hopefully, fingers crossed, on the day it'll be all right. It's different when you build your own boat, though, isn't it? It is. It's worrying, you know. Everyone, everyone, like, you know, who buys boats and stuff would probably like to see someone like ourselves, you know, fail more. But I don't know. It would be a good feel if you won it, wouldn't it? Very good. It might be good for business as well. That's for sure. This is the third and final heat. If Little and Arthur finish fifth or better, no one can catch them. If they finish sixth, Ingverson could snatch it. Or if it's seventh, Montebocchi or staff might be the beneficiaries. So there's plenty to play for. Once again, it's 70 miles, five laps, and Ingverson off to a flyer. The rest will surely get to mark one behind him. Little and Arthur will be close, as will Hill and Montevocchi, although both have chosen a rather scenic route. And the conditions still continue to disappoint the rough water specialist. The fact that no one recollects three consecutive races here as flat as this is little consolation. All streaming past Mark 1. And there goes Montevocchi. The cost of his excursion already evident, with Steve Nicholl, Kevin Walsh and Johnny Anderson in 11th, 12th and 13th ahead of him. But the Italian on a roll, making good ground. But there's an awful lot of that to do. And a lovely battle going on on his right. And there it is, the sun shines on Walsh near side. Hill center and Nicole far side. The battle's for 12. And the speed on the helicopter just on 80 miles an hour. Great scrap. Moving up, Via and Martirano, 12th in race one, 7th in race two, 11th here, but passing Carpatello and Mark Fox. That will put them up to ninth behind Mumford. But this is poetry in motion. Ingverson knows the odds are stacked against him winning the championship, but another resounding victory would surely fill the order books for Peter Little, but in his case, race three victory, much less relevant. But what a performance here so far from Ulrichsen, matching the scenery, absolutely stunning. The lead is already two miles, it's increasing by the second, and the helicopter ground speed, an amazing 84.5 miles an hour. Very little Smith or anyone else could do about that. Although the Jersman found this patch of ocean very much to his liking, his race was interrupted on lap three. Montevocci in search of that elusive mile per hour to give him victory in the Roberti, 
had fallen foul of a rogue wash, stuffed the boat and was seriously injured. Smith stopped to assist. Those are the rules. The situation then is any driver who has stopped to render assistance at any incident is awarded the position he was in at the time of the stopping. In this case, it was a third. Going into their final circumnavigation, Ingvarsson and Anderson were over six miles in the lead. And it was a very long time since anyone remembers that happening. Elsewhere, staff number one, fifth at the end of lap one, had carved his way back to third, disposing of Carpatella, 51 on the way. And that, if he could hold on to it, would be good enough for championship third. Hammerstedt, Fox and Johnny Anderson, on the other hand, were treating the battle for championship tenth equally seriously. And Fox, in particular, determined to keep his position as the first Guernsey boat home, if at times precariously. But the performance of the day belonged to the Argentinians. 11th halfway on lap one, this was four. What a pity such form hadn't come earlier in the championship. Ulrikson will say, all oh, for the sake of a spark plug in heat two, the championship was lost. But we shall never know. What we do know is that after one hour, 15 minutes and 18 seconds, at an average speed of 63.57 miles an hour, he and Anderson won heat three. Atom Staff and Fred Morton Lean were third, but... Already home in second was number 27. Peter Little and David Arthur from England were the new world champions. And this was how it finished up. Comfortable enough in the end for the English number one crew. Ingvarsson disappointed and rightly so. But the rest were never quite good enough on the day to deserve more than they got. Ladies and gentlemen, the winners, the world championships of 1997. The winners of the Guernsey Gold Cup. Seas 27, City of Shell, Peter Little and Dave Arthur from Great Britain. Good on you. Well done. Fantastic. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. We've been trying since we won the 1.3 Worlds in 91. Um, so it's been six years, really, and yeah, we're, we're obviously very pleased now. It's good. It's your own boat. Where does it all go from here? Well, we've got to move on for next year now, I suppose. We'll carry up with race the rest of this year in the same boat, and next year we'll try and get quicker again. And so the islands got back to normal. On Sark, that means pony and cart, push bike, or simply shanks. Truly wonderful.